Incitement is one of the top trending search terms on Google right now, and that's probably not surprising to you. You cannot turn on the news, Fox, NBC, ABC, CNN. You can't turn on the news right now without hearing somebody talking about inciting a riot or inciting an insurrection. But what exactly does that term mean? It's a legal term of art, and in this video, I'm going to break it down and explain it to you with examples exactly what the word incitement means. But before we do that, I want to quickly invite you to hit that subscribe button below and turn the bell notification icon on so that you do not miss any of my update videos about law and current events in plain English. Now, one last thing. This video is not legal advice. It's for educational purposes only. So with that out of the way, let's get into the video. The First Amendment recognizes our right to freedom of speech as Americans. It restricts the government from creating laws that punish people for saying or doing or expressing themselves in a certain way. But that freedom is not without its limits. There are certain things that you just cannot say for the greater good. For example, you cannot engage in defamation. You can't slander and lie about somebody to hurt their reputation because that's simply not worthy of our freedom of speech protection. Also, you can't lie under oath. That is called perjury and it's a crime. Now, one other category of speech that is not protected by the First Amendment is called incitement. So how is incitement defined? Well, first let's look at the Black's Law Dictionary for its definition of incitement. The Black's Law Dictionary defines incitement as the act or an instance of provoking, urging on, or stirring up. Under criminal law, it refers to the act of persuading another person to commit a crime. So that is how Black's Law Dictionary defines the term incitement, but the Supreme Court has made a different definition, a more narrow definition of the term. In 1919, the Supreme Court gave us the clear and present danger test for determining when speech qualifies as incitement. The case was Schenck versus United States. During World War I, Charles Schenck and Elizabeth Baer were political activists in Philadelphia who were handing out pamphlets to Americans who were eligible to be drafted into the war. The pamphlets urged people to peacefully oppose the draft and told them that if they were to be drafted, they could actually refuse to go to war on the ground that the draft violated the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment, of course, banned slavery and involuntary servitude in the United States. Schenck and Bear were prosecuted for handing out pamphlets under a federal law that made it a crime to obstruct the U.S. military's recruitment and enlistment efforts. They were sentenced to nine months in prison. The two defendants appealed their case to the U.S. Supreme Court, where they argued that their handing out of pamphlets was protected speech under the First Amendment. The Supreme Court disagreed and upheld their convictions. The court held that the defendant's statements urging others to oppose the draft were not protected speech by the First Amendment because it encouraged others to break the law and created a clear and present danger to the enlistment and recruiting service of the U.S. military during a time of war. Now, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes gave us a famous example of unprotected speech that is incitement likely to incite clear and present danger. He said that yelling fire falsely in a movie theater, a very crowded movie theater, would cause panic and a stampede for the exit. That kind of speech has no value and it creates danger that is clear and present to other people. Therefore, it is not protected by the First Amendment. Perhaps a more modern example of that would be yelling bomb on an airplane or a subway that's very crowded. You are bound to cause clear and present danger to those around you, and so you're not able to say that under the First Amendment. In 1969, the Supreme Court gave us a slightly different definition of incitement. The case was Brandenburg versus Ohio. This case involved a man in Ohio named Clarence Brandenburg. Mr. Brandenburg gave a hate-filled speech at a Klan rally to his fellow members. Some of the members in the crowd even were brandishing shotguns. Brandenburg had invited a reporter to film the rally. The reporter captured Brandenburg on film saying, quote, We're not a revenge organization. Our Congress or Supreme Court continues to suppress our race. It's possible that there might have to be some revenge taken, end quote. 
Now, after footage of Brandenburg's speech aired on television, the state of Ohio convicted and sentenced him to prison for violating a law that made it a crime to encourage political reform through the use of violence. Brandenburg appealed his conviction, arguing that his speech was protected under the First Amendment. The Supreme Court actually agreed that Brandenburg's speech was protected and overturned his conviction. In doing so, the court created a two-prong test for determining when a statement is incitement that falls outside of our right to free speech. The court held that speech is unprotected incitement if, number one, it is intended to incite or produce immediate lawless action, emphasis on immediate, and number two, is likely to incite or produce such action, emphasis on likely. The court pointed out that Brandenburg's speech, though hateful as it was, did not encourage immediate violence or unlawful actions. Instead, Brandenburg made only vague, conditional threats that if things did not go his way at some undefined point in time in the future, he would take, quote, revengeance, which is not even a real word. The court therefore ruled that Brandenburg's speech did not meet the definition of incitement and was protected by the First Amendment. Brandenburg's definition of incitement is still the definition that courts across the country must apply today when deciding whether a person's speech qualifies as incitement or protected speech. Now let's talk about incitement of a riot. Many states already criminalize incitement of a riot and the federal anti-riot statute criminalizes the use of interstate commerce to incite a riot. So what type of speech would qualify as incitement of a riot? Well, based on how the Supreme Court has defined incitement in the cases we just talked about, I would argue that inciting a riot means speech that's intended and likely to trigger or provoke a group of people to riot right then, right there, immediately. For example, if a protester yells to an angry mob of protesters or an angry group of protesters, let's smash the windows with bricks or let's flip this car over or let's storm the building, then that clearly is incitement and it's not protected speech. If, on the other hand, a protester posts on Facebook to fellow protesters the night before a big protest, let's do something that will get everybody's attention and let them know we're serious, that is probably not incitement because it's not clear that the post is encouraging destruction or violence. And even if it was clear from the context in which that statement was made, that the speaker is encouraging the protesters to engage in violent behavior, it's not likely to trigger immediate acts of violence. The protesters to whom the post was sent had plenty of time to calmly reflect on things and make their own decision about what they would do at the protest the next day. If you like this video, let me know by giving it a like. And if you haven't already, don't forget to hit that subscribe button below and turn the bell notification icon on so that you don't miss any of my videos about law and current events in plain English. I also make a lot of videos about the stimulus checks, so make sure to subscribe. And that's all I've got for you today. As always, thank you for watching.